our main presentation um, is uh, with Jennifer Talley. Um, she knows a thing or three about session brewing, um, session beer brewing. Um, just just as a um, sort of a baseline, um, Jennifer was brewing at uh, Squatters Pub in um, in Utah for you know twenty plus years, and so you know brewing four uh, percent and lower four percent and lower beers for twenty years probably gives her a bit of a, a base for knowing a thing or three about session beers. Are we ready to? Uh... Hi, Jennifer. Hi, how's it going? Can uh, everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. That was important. Um, so, hello to everyone. Um, okay, well, uh, I've never spoken with your club before, so first I want to do is say uh, thank you. Um, I really love talking to brewers, home brewers, professional brewers, just anyone making beer. I love, I love a reason to talk about beer. So, well, welcome, thanks for welcome, having me. welcome. Yeah, it was really hot here today. I live in Grass Valley, California. That's where I'm residing. Um, was it super hot in San Diego? Not too, not too bad today. I think just under uh, 70 degrees on the coast. Okay. Wow, that's nice. It's boiling up here. Um, I'm about an hour of, out of Sacramento towards Truckee. So, uh, so well, the first thing I want to do after uh, thanking you is... Um, just to give you a little bit of information for those who might not know um, a little bit of history about me. So, and the reason why I'm telling you is please questions. I mean, I want it to be interactive. So um, I, anyone who raises their hand, please um, as the mo moderator, just stop me and do some questions, you know, cause I'll just keep talking unless somebody stops me and asks me questions and I want it to be interactive. So anything you guys want to say, just please, and girls, uh, let me know um, uh, whenever you have a question. There so uh, as um, we are, uh, the introduction was, and I, uh, I started at Squatters Club Brewer. I started as a home brewer. And uh, I home brewed for about five years. And then about, no, about four years before I was 21. And I started out, um, for those who don't know, I... Uh, I followed the Grateful Dead for about 10 years uh, when I was started about f age 14 till I was, till Mr. Jerry Garcia died um, in July um, of 1995. So I was about oh, 25 by then. And um, so it was a long, you know, I, I just spent a lot of time seeing concerts and, and uh, enjoying uh, really good beer. Deadheads aren't, are pretty poor and homeless for the most part, but they have a fine taste for things that they like. So when I would come out of the concert, um, there would be ice chests filled with, you know, Taddy Cat Porter, Taddy Cat Porter and um, Oatmeal Stout, Samuel Smith's Oatmeal Stout, of course, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And I just grew up loving great beer um, and great craft beer. I started homebrewing. I thought that was really fun in the 80s. And then I am... Um, decided that I want to go back to college and I just kind of switched gears from being a young deadhead to a college student that had a job. And I started out at Squatters Club Brewery um, April 15th. So I guess that's coming up here soon. Uh, 1991. I was 21 years old. And so the first 20 years of my brewing life, professional brewing life, I brewed only 4% ABV beer. I would say 15 the last five, we started, I started making uh, beers and the production facility started making beers that were higher in alcohol and they, they just had to be in the package. That was the stipulation for Utah. You had, if you're going to make a beer higher than 4%, you had to be packaged, packaged beer, like can or bottle or whatnot. Uh, if it was on tap, 4% ABV. That was the rule. Um, and that's three, two by weight because everybody knows, oh, isn't it 3-2? Well, that's ABWs, and that's 4% ABV. So I like to kind of apples to apples. So I be, brewing, brewing lower alcohol beer was the only thing I ever knew. Um, I never didn't know about, I just, 
I was, you know, isolated, like on an island. It's like being an artist, not being given the color blue, but I didn't even know blue existed. So I wasn't angry or mad. I just did the best I could with the tools I was, I was given. Um, I had about 14 taps. So I wanted to give a lot of different types of beers for folks. I wanted to have everybody satisfied my customers. So the, my biggest challenge was differentiating all my taps, all my beers and styles um, with the same ABV. I really didn't go a lot lower than 4%. My British mild, I would dip down. Um, but for the most part, I, came at, I kept at about four. Uh, and then I just had to use my hops, my dry hopping techniques, my grist ratios, um, anything I could think of. And I had some nitrogenated taps I worked on um, to differentiate it. Because one thing I can't stand, and it doesn't, it's not just with low alcohol beers, is when you go to a pub or someone's home that has their homebrew and every single beer tastes the same, it's just different colors. I like it when there's different, different flavors going on and you got something to talk about and something's interesting. I don't need it to be new all the time. I just don't want to taste like the last beer I had. So, um, so I, I really, really enjoyed learning how to brew 4% ABV. I really enjoyed it a lot, but after about 20 years, towards the end of that, I started to get a little bored. Um, I, thought that I had kind of run as far as I could have run in, you know, in that brewing system. I could have probably worked the rest of my life there. The owners are fantastic. Now they since now have bought it back from monster because they ended up going on and buying uh, cigar city. The owners sold it. They bought cigar city. They bought Oscar blues this hedge fund company out of New York. And they ended up becoming what's called canarchy. Well, canarchy um, since has sold the pubs back to the original owners who I worked for. So I still keep in touch with them. We're still a really, really good family. My brewmaster's name was Dan Burek. I learned every, you know, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from my friends, but most, most brewers say, okay, this was kind of the original brewmaster that taught me. And he works now selling grease, grease malted, grease, grease malted barley out of, in the Rocky Mountains. So by the end, I started traveling to Belgium. I started traveling to Germany. Um, and in Belgium, I met, you know, Yvonne, um, Yvonne uh, Debates. I met Yvonne, I can't remember his last name, from Cantillon. And um, um, a lot of, lot of great people. Um, 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 Brewmaster Marie Rock from Orval. Lot, um, Frank Boone, and I just went all over learning about sour beers. I, I traveled with Vinny and Natalie, and I traveled with uh, Matt from Firestone and Mr. Mallet, who wrote the book on malts, and just really opened my eyes to sour beer production. So I went back and started making sour beers, and making different beers of different alcohol rates, and eventually moved on um, and decided I want to learn more and I needed to get to a different brewery. So I ended up brewing at Russian River as, a, as their lead brewer. I ended up brewing at Red Hook on a huge production scale. I ended up brewing at Auburn Ale House. I opened my own brew pub up in Grass Valley called 1849. COVID was hard on us. Um, I got out financially unscathed, but I'm on to doing other things, working with equipment manufacturers. And I'll get to kind of that towards the end about helping grow the South American craft brew scene. So um, I, my life is, my, my work has taken a lot of different ups and downs and turns and it's been fantastic. I could, you know, so happy I could, I'm so happy I realized I was a brewer at a young age. I think I was kind of born one, but that's just my own hippie stuff. Uh, but session beers is what we're here to talk about and I absolutely love them. Uh, I can see that all of you, I, I, well, I can, I can sense by reading through some of these notes and looking at your club and, and the conversations that I've been having uh, leading, you know, with the weeks leading up to this, that you guys are brewers, which is cool. So then I can talk to you on that uh, different kind of level where you kind of understand what, a lot about what's going on. Um, probably a lot more than some professional brewers out there, but that's, you know, <laughs> home brewers are fantastic. You know, they're just, they're just, almost as they're as good or better than a lot of professional brewers. I know they just make small batches. That's really the only difference. Um, and then maybe they don't have access to some of the tools we have in the lab. But uh, so first of all, you know, I don't know who's read the book, who hasn't read the book. I don't really want to just kind of reiterate the book. I mean, it's not that expensive on Amazon. That'd be my plug. It's like 13 bucks. I'm sure you can find it cheaper. 
I love it. I mean, I really, it was an incredible process for me to write this book. It took two years and the Brewers Association was really great. They had great editors for me. Uh, um, but the thing I enjoyed the most was reaching out and learning more and more about session beers that I didn't even know about, you know. Um, I learned so much and I challenged a lot of my ideas because it's one thing to be standing around a beer festival and um, spouting off something you think you know. And it's another thing to write it down in a book <laughs> that you know all your friends are going to read. Yeah, so you got to really make sure, you know, what you're saying. You can't just make statements that aren't backed up. So I got to have a lot of fun with the research. Um, uh, if there's not any questions right now, I wanted to kind of maybe go through basically uh, the process of well, I, making a session beer, my process. I have, I have, process, I have a process. comment. I have a comment yeah. about, about your book. Um, sure. This is Lauren, by the way. Um, hey, Lauren. Hi. It's been fun um, emailing with you lately. Um, but my comment was, um, it's too bad that you're, you're not here in person because we have some members who are upset that this is not actually a book signing session. Oh, well, <laughs> invite me back and I'll bring a bunch of books and and then we can have one. And I could talk about dry hopping techniques for 45 minutes or I could talk about okay. how to brew sour beers for 45 minutes and I'll just happen to bring my session book. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks. Anyone who mails me a session book, I'd be happy to sign it, but it's more fun to do it in per person. So. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, you know, basically when I was when I was designing session beers um, uh, at Squatters and, 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 and beyond, I even designed them, you know, when I, you know, made, you know, ESB and uh, for Red Hook and I made uh, Long Hammer. I made, um, that was not a session, that's about 6%, but I was making a lot of Kona beers because when I worked for CBA, I made a lot of BJ's. We produced a lot of BJ's beers, Red Hook's lineup, Widmere's lineup, the Haifa, and we put, produced um, production beer brewing for Kona. So, um, you know, I brew a lot of session beers even after that. There, you can usually find one or two on tap at any multi-tap pub or any brew pub. Uh, first, you know, I always start when I design beers um, from the back of it, from what the beer is going to taste like, to then how to build it. So it's like, you know, reading a magazine from back to front. It's just the way my mind works. Might have been the Griffith Dead shows, I don't know, but it's definitely the way it's we're always worked for me. So I would envision what I wanted to be drinking. I would envision what I wanted to taste, how I wanted to represent, if it was a historical style, like a dry Irish stout, um, that, you know, I would go ahead and I would read about the history and I would kind of get the passion going inside, and learn about what was going on in the economy or in the country of the time where the beer spawned from. Um, I would then go down to the store. I'd buy as many of this type of beer as I could find. Doesn't matter if it was craft beer, it was made in North America or if it was made in the, the actual country. I would just go through a, a huge tasting with myself and whoever would join me. And I always had a lot of participants because I never liked to design, design beers in a vacuum. I always like to talk to other people about it. And then I would get the flavors and then I would kind of push everything aside and I get my brew sheet out and I start with a pencil and I just start writing down my recipe. Um, I don't cop, I don't like to copy other people, but I just like to have inspiration and get to know something, especially if I'm going to put a style guideline on it and kind of put it in a box, as you would say, some beers kind of have these boxes, some beers have these boxes and we take them to a different place and put a new blueberry in it or you know, I guess pastry flavor, I guess people are making pastry beers now and, or they have been, I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me what that is at some point. I don't know. Does it have to do with dough? I don't know, but I've never We're, made Yeah, We, we wonder about that too. Yeah. Okay. So, well, what I'm saying is, you know, without being disrespectful to the creativity that's going on in the craft brew world, when I grew up in uh, brewing, it was very classic brewing styles and there are people still doing it. So I, I paid a lot of homage an honor to, you know, the history and um, the flavors that were developed. Um, sometimes I would do my own take. And then sometimes I would make beers that just didn't have a style, didn't have a box, and I would just name it whatever and do, just didn't, did, didn't put a style to it. And I would say, you know, it could kind of be like this, but it's more robust and it just is its own thing. Um, so for, uh, so, so I, would, I would envision the beer I'm drinking and then I'm like, okay, I want to make, you know, 
uh, you know, session IPA. So I would go up into the malt room and, you know, some two row. Um, I never use caramel malts in my IPAs, any, any, any type of IPAs. I didn't use caramel malt. Um, that doesn't I mean it's not allowed. There's no that hard rules and really a lot of brewing except for keep your dissolved oxygen down, except when you want it and then make sure it's correct when you want it. We can talk about that. So uh, how I would build basically throughout the whole process of making a 4% session beer that has flavor and it's interesting and it's not thin and it doesn't taste like water and, uh, but it stays at 4%, but it's not too cloyingly sweet is you're trying to build body everywhere you can and mouthfeel. Okay. Because alcohol is a major flavor constituent. And when you take it away and keep it very low, you, you, you have to find that body and mouthfeel other places, but you certainly don't want to find it in residual sugar. And you don't want to leave a bunch of sugar unfermented behind because that, you know, just low ABV does not make a session beer in and of itself. If the beer is not high in quality, I don't care what alcohol it is. If it's 4%, 3%, that doesn't make it a great session beer. My definition of a great session beer is one that you can drink many of, okay? One that you can drink throughout an entire session, and that is um, a session with friends sitting around. Um, in England, they call them round buys. Uh, round buys. That means, you know, you'd have eight, you know, mates in a pub, and it was, okay, it's your turn, you know, Lewis, it's your turn, Alex, you know, and they would actually have systems on their arms where they would have, like, circles, and they, and I was once in Berlin, and they were doing a round by system and they were using a pen because they had like seven friends and they were all out at this crazy dance hall place. And I was like, what are you guys doing on your arms? And they're like, oh, it's like how we keep track when we're drinking on how to make sure we know who buys the next one, who buys the next beer. Well, these are called sessions. I mean, you can't sit. I mean, I'm sure there's some people that you can um, drink 10, 9% beers, but not a lot of people I know. So um, a lot of times these beers that people are drinking are the, the lower alcohol. They're going to be drinking all night and drinking for a long period of time. Speaking, so, of drinking, speaking of drinking all night, is there one that you would like us to pour, Jennifer? You're welcome to pour. The, the, the one I would start with would be the, um, I would start with the Boddington's. That you sounds know, great. Um, yeah, go ahead and start pouring it. Um, I would, so, so I would, I would develop my mall profile to try to, to, to build a little body into it. And so I did, I am not a fan of dextrin malt. Um, and I'm not talking about dextrose, not corn sugar. I'm talking about dextrin, um, which is, you know, provides, um, um, unfermentable sugars and unferment, you know, body without giving fermentability. I'm not a big fan of carapels. I didn't like the way it sounded when it went through my mill. I didn't really see the results in the body. So I ditched it at a very early part of my career, um, and I would try to build um, some body with Munich malt, just very low Levy Bond Munich Levy Bond Munich malt, Munich one. I was in most of my session beers five to fifteen percent, um, and I really like the um, even up to twenty percent. I really like the flavor of a good Munich malt. Malt. I usually I use a lot of Weirman, so a lot of my specialty malts came from Weirman. Um, the mash parameters were really important. Um, I would use, uh, I always had mashed in higher. Uh, I've been speaking a lot in South America, so this is kind of nice. I get to speak in Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, I would be about 156, 157 Fahrenheit. And the higher the mash temperature, the more unfermentable sugars you create and um, the less fermentable sugars you create. Therefore, once again, building body in the final beer. Um, I would keep the bitterness in, in line. So when I went to, I went through two brewing schools. I went through Siebel Institute of Brewing Technology and I also went through um, um, the MBAA Brewing School in Madison, Wisconsin called Malt, Malting and Barling and the Science of Brewing. I forgot the exact name, but, um, and what I studied at Siebel, Elsa was our instructor. She was our sensory instructor. And she, at the time, and I don't know where the science is now. I'd really like to, I'm, I'm excited to meet some of my sensory um, mentors and ask them next time I see them at conferences and such, um, is find out where the, the, the scientific study is now. She said that our human palate could not 
really actually could not detect over the difference between above 45 IBU. So she said if he had a 65 IBU beer sitting exactly the same made, made exactly the same with the same process, the same healthy yeast, and you set it next to the same exact thing, same beer, same malt, same parameters, same brewery, you know, keeping everything constant except for those BUs, and you had one at 45, one at 65, you would not be able to tell the difference in the IBUs. Now, I can't say that's fact, but there's a lot of science that it's, it's very hard. People talk about perceived bitterness um, and different types of bitterness. I absolutely believe we haven't even scratched the surface on the subject of quality of bitterness, but I was diving into it quite a bit when I was brewing at Squatters, meaning I was reading about it. And then especially when I wrote the book, there's, an, there's a section on quality of bitterness. And I worked a lot um, with a lot of great hop people. Um, and uh, uh, Val Peacock was one of them. He, used to, he worked for AB uh, Budweiser before AB InBev bought them. And then when AB InBev bought them, they kind of let a lot of those really great scientific guys go that were kind of leading the way in, in our industry, in the brewing industry, on um, research. Um, so when I designed the bitterness into this beer, I really want to think about what I'm doing. So I kept, it was, I was very rare that I put my session beers over 45 IBUs. It was very important that you kept it in line because it could greatly cloud you know, all the other complexities or dynamics behind your beer. Um, and then water, of course, as you know, you have a 4% session beer, 96% of it is, is, you know, water. I mean, it's the beer part, but it's made of water. So in Utah, we have really hard water. So I didn't test for pH in my hot liquor. I tested for alkalinity. And I, it was very hard, so I needed to drive that alkalinity. You get your alkalinity in line, your pH is going to follow. So get that little pool test kit. You probably all have them in your homebrew labs. And, you know, you want to be kind of around 40 to 50. Um, and that's, uh, gosh, don't don't kill me if I get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's PPM. I think the only thing I talk in PPB is about is, is um is my dissolved oxygen and finished beer. So, um, and TPO. So uh, I would I would keep that about 40 to 50 and um, my alkalinity. And I did that in my hot liquor tank. So then of course all the bicarbonate would drop out, which would cause scale. So I would then have to descale it, and use sulfanic acid because I had a copper electrical coil in there and phosphoric and nitric pit it. So it was always, there was always such fun things that I had to challenge. Um, the water, um, I also used calcium chloride for almost all my session beers. Um, I did not combine gypsum in there. And my jury, meaning my head, is still out on whether I could be better at my water. I think you can always be better at your water. But calcium chloride, as you know, um, adds a little mouthfeel, a little body to the beer. And that's, that's, so that's helpful. The Munich malt was helpful. The high, high temperatures of mash were helpful. Um, keeping the bitterness in line was helpful. But the, the most important thing about brewing a session beer is quality. And like I said, yes, it needs, you know, I, for the book, I sent my definition on ABV 5% or below. And, you know, Lewis will, um, or Lou Bryson, I think his last name is, he's really into session beers and he's a beer writer as well. And, and a friend, he thinks 4-2 and nobody, you know, everyone has to define it as 4-2. Well, how I justified myself and please argue with me or not, uh, if you want is I don't know who can't go to Germany and drink Weiss beer, which is our next one we drink, and, um, and drink it all day, all night, days on end. I mean, when you go to Germany, then instead of kiosks with pastries and coffee, they're drinking Weiss beer as they're waiting to, to get on the subway to go to work. Um, it's on the tables for dinner, and it's, it's 5%. 90% of all beer in Germany is 5%. It's called Vol beer, and it's 5% or lower. So I sent, I set my personal definition um, at 5% or lower uh, for session beer. Uh, do you guys have any comments about that, the definition or beliefs, or what do you guys think? And what do you think of the Boddingtons? Um, I am not drinking it in front of you because there is not a Boddingtons to be had in Grass Valley. It's uh, a, Jennifer? it is a city of four. Sorry. 14%. We have a, yes. We have a question here. Hold on. Sure. 
Hi, Jennifer. Uh, you talked about you know, utilizing chlorides, like calcium chloride in particular, to uh, accentuate the malt flavors. Uh, and one of the things that I've heard about being talked about, balancing out the IBUs versus the actual gravity, how do you utilize you know, that lower gravity and then use like figuring out the difference, like the difference between what that lower gravity is and being able to accentuate those malt flavors to match up with sort of the IBUs to create a good balance? That's a good question. It's a big, huge question. So basically you said it a couple times, I think, in your question. And you remember in one of my lifelong tenets is the answer is always in the question. So you're talking about balance and that's exactly what you do. Um, my special, just like, you know, my specialty malts weren't loaded up. Everything is a light hand in session brewing. So if my BUs were at, like for a Boddington's, you know, style, um, my BUs, I, you know, as a not mistaken, it's a cream ale, right? And, um, and it should be nitrogenated. You should be drinking out of the can with the widget. I'm, I don't know what that was purchased for you, but um, that's, I think, the BUs on a cream is... I want to say, is it like the low twenties? Correct me if I'm wrong, right? I would say 18, maybe even, you know, 16 to 20. Um, so, because there's no specialty malt in that, there's no hop flavor supposed to be going on in a cream ale. It's supposed to have the texture of cre creaminess without being residual sweetness. So to answer your question without being too long winded is depending on the type of malt I had, if I had a large amount of, you know, you know, specialty malt, roasted barley, or, you know, um, Car 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 Aroma, which is like a 145, 147, Levy Bond, wonderful, wonderful flavors, or Cara Red, or a dark, a dark Munich, or, you know, God help me, not a victory malt. We got out of that phase. Um, but it's just, it just, it's so easily overused. You have to get such a light hand on that victory malt. Um, something big, like, you know, of character, then you can come up a little in BUs, especially if the style warrants it. You know, so you've got to really, it's really artistic. You really have got to know your malt and you really got to know what you're going for. And then you really got to know your hops. And you, most importantly, you, getting back to quality of bitterness is you need to know how to place your hops. So the, the, the hazy, I'm not going to say anything negative about hazy beers. I'm going to try not to. And I think people should like what they like what they want to like. And there are some hazy beers I really like from Fieldworks. Um, however, the idea of putting a lot of bitterness in at the end and nothing in the beginning is very odd to me. I, um, I brewed a lot of beers um, when I brewed in very classic styles. I put bittering hops at the beginning and aroma hops at the end. And then I went through my 20s and tried to dismantle everything I was taught and think I could think of something new. And I switched everything up. I started noticing that if I drove my, bit, my, my bitterness units towards the end of my boil, five minutes to EOB, Whirlpool, um, and I, you know, I always, I hand calculate every single time I brew. Every single time I have brewed and every single time I brew in the future, I hand calculate my hop, my BUs. I don't use a Calculate. I, I use a calculator, but it's just old school hand calculation um, by the NBAA. And I figure out my bitterness. I know my utilization. I know my alphas. I know, um, you know, the, I know the utilization, the alphas. And then depending on the boil time depends on, you know, my utilization rate and all of this. So I would hand calculate them. And if I drove that bitterness at the end of boil in Whirlpool or whatnot, and it, it could be very harsh. It's not a pleasant, it's a different type of, bit. all bitterness is not equal. It's different depending on where you bring the bitterness out of the wort while boiling. And this is what I'm talking about. I, I cannot point to a scientific paper, but I would love to talk to Shellhammer about it. I would love to talk to OSU guys about it more. And maybe someone's written one and I just haven't read it yet, but I, I think there's a lot of future in the study of bitterness and how it's experienced. So to answer your question long-windedly again is balance, balancing your bitterness with what else is happening. Now, as far as the calcium chloride goes, I have a really great mineral salt calculator um, that was given to me by some folks at CBA, um, Joe Casey, and it separates the calcium from the chloride so I can figure out exactly how much calcium I'm getting into my wort 
in the mash process because calcium is needed in the mash process and it's needed in the boil process. We need it both places. You only bring over 40% of what you put into the mash process into the kettle. So I designed my beers between 80 and 100 um, ppm of calcium in the mash. Um, so through calcium chloride, I put it in, um, I put it in, in the, you know, throughout the mashing process. And then, and then I take 40% of, let's say I had, you know, um, hundred PPM. So then I bring 40 PPMs coming over to the kettle. That means I need to add more into the kettle to get back up to 80 to hundred. So my parameter for the mash and the kettle is the same 80 to hundred, 80 to hundred, uh, PPM. And then I take into account that I bring 40 over in this case from the mash. So putting calcium in both places was very, very helpful. Um, and then of course, a sit, if I had just two row or all pale malt, no specialty at all, then even with my alkalinity in line, I needed to buffer that mash. And because my sparge water, um, you know, my, my, it just, it, it would, it would rise. And so to buffer that, um, for a Pilsner brew, I acidified my foundation water. Um, and that's, that's a little bit of a process to learn. I'm sure most of you guys already do it. Um, I use lactic, um, but you can use phosphoric, um, but it's a high percentage and it's a food grade, high, high percentage made for this. And I would pour that into the foundation water. So getting your pH in line. So Thomas Kuhns recommends five, four to five, six. See all these parameters, I call them critical control points. And they're very important to hit because this all represents the quality of the brew you're doing. And it's very easy to mess these up. And if you don't hit your mash pH right, you over bitter your beer. You don't use the right salts. Um, all of these things are going to affect the end flavor of a beer and really reduce its drinkability. Now, if you've got a big 8% alcohol beer, you don't notice them as much, I believe, as you do in a really gentle 4% beer. And so I was really um, obsessed um, with making sure I hit my parameters very closely. But they're the same parameters for 4% beer for the most part, except for the, you know, the dynamics of your grist bill, the dynamics of your BUs and the salt. Sure, that's different. But the pHs, your water treatment process, gently rolling your wort into your kettle, not splashing it around. I mean, the transfers, the oxygen, you know, a lot of the parameters are the same for making a beer of high alcohol. It's just, you have to be very astute about it. Um, does anybody want to tell me about their comments about the Boddingtons they're drinking since I don't have one? No? Hey, I, I have a question, Jennifer, on yeah. uh, adjuncts. Uh, okay. Beers. Uh, what's your experience there? Well, um, is your name Stan? I'm Jack. You're Jack. Okay. Your last name Stanley? No, Jack. No. Jack. Okay. Sorry, Jack. Um, well, that's a great question because I um, actually firmly believe in the use of adjuncts in any beer. If you would like, to, if you believe, if it if it helps the beer become a better beer, um, there's adjuncts in Pliny. We all love Pliny. I love Pliny. It's a fantastic beer. I love it with craft brewers say, oh, well, you know, I don't use adjuncts. I'm an all malt brewer. But yeah, they pour bags and bags of sugar in their double IPA. It's an adjunct. Um, so um, adjuncts is a tool in your toolbox. Um, um, I didn't use, I used some adjuncts. I used adjuncts, oh, Cinco de Mayo tomorrow in my Mexican lager. I used corn. It's a part of the flavor profile. If I made an American premium lager, I used adjuncts. So I believe in... Now, if anyone walks out of the room, I, it's okay. People get mad at me when I say this, but I'm allowed to have an opinion after 30 years. Um, <laughs> and being a brewer, I, um, Augustus Bush came over and he used, um, he did not use adjuncts. He brewed his family's Hellas. He called it um, Boudvar, right? He ripped off all the marketing. As we know the story, we don't need to go into that. Not the, not the king of beers, but the beer of kings, right? So, um, we were building the country. It was hot. It wasn't cold like Germany. And he, um, people really didn't like his beer that much. Um, it wasn't going over so well. Sales weren't going well. So he was studying J.E. Siebel at the time. 
And, he, and there was a lot of research being done on adjuncts, which as you guys know, is how you get sugar that, you know, other ways than, you know, uh, malted barley. So honey, rice, corn, all these things. So he, he built the cereal, he built a cereal cooker and he started reducing the heavy body of his Hellas um, with rice and lightening the beer's body because his customers were wanting it to be light. Now, everyone always says the story, oh, well, you know, Budweiser and Coors and American Premium Lagers, they do that because they're cheap. They sell cheap beer and they have cheap ingredients. Well, maybe they're happy about the price of rice and corn now, but I actually had to get on the phone with the USDA and find the USDA people that actually wanted to sit and muse this with me. And really, they had a blast. And sometimes it would take... Um, a day to write an entire chapter. Well, not exactly, but it would take, it would be easy. I just fly through it. And sometimes it would take a month to write a couple lines. This is one of those proving of those points I talked to you about earlier, or at least trying to back it up with some real science evidence. So I got a hold of USDA and we got a hold of some very, very old, old records back in the mid 1800s. And I wanted to know um, if what the price of barley was at the time compared to rice and corn because that that would define my my, my point that the reason and it was jim helmke brewmaster 30-year brewmaster at yingling that tipped me off to this possibility he goes jen you got to remember when i was doing research for the book that american premium lagers um the reason they brought adjuncts into their beer was not because of price it was because of quality and flavor and taste at the time and i said whoa i gotta prove this i gotta see if this is right so sure enough there was only barley back then it wasn't feed barley and malted barley it was just barley and and it sure enough back in the time the price of barley was up and down all over the place and it was very inconsistent as far as the efficiency of it too so the brewers were not hitting their platos they would be up and down and it was just you know the malting process was not refined back in the 1800s in North America, um, uh, but rice we could get, and it would be a lot more consistent. Sorry, and it was a lot cheap, and it was a lot, but it was more expensive. And um, but he included it, even though the price of rice was consistently more expensive than barley, because he wanted to lighten his body. Um, so I do believe in the use of adjuncts. Now I don't use adjuncts in making a session IPA. However, I think a little rice would taste pretty nice, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm not scared to use adjuncts where I think adjuncts are warranted, you know. So I, would, I don't use adjuncts in a, a nice hearty amber ale, or, um, but I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I was thinking specifically lactose, you know, just a little dab of lactose to kind of round out and fill and give a little sweet finish, you know. It's very uh, if you want that, if you want a little sweet finish and you want to round that, yeah, sure. Cream ale would probably be a real good place to use that. Certainly wouldn't use it in the German pills. And I certainly wouldn't use it in, use it in a, a vice beer, a heap of ice or a crystal vice, you know, the dry snappy beers we love so much. Um, maybe a Kolsch, I don't know. Maybe, you know, you can play around with that. It all, like I said, it all goes back to keeping that end result in mind, you know, because you use some words there and you don't always want a little bit of the sweet or, you know, you always don't want it to be round. Sometimes you want it to be snap. And so, and a little drier and crisper. So I think that'd be a wonderful thing to play with. And so I do usually end that rant about Augustus Bushes. It's one of the first craft brewers in North America. People hate it when I say that. <laughs> but he changed his recipe to appease his community. And it worked. Now, obviously, you know, they're far from craft beer now. But um, when it started, it started very small and it started very humble, you know. So what did you think of the Boddingtons? Is it, did it come in good shape or is, or is it oxidized? Because most of the time when I buy Boddingtons, I, fi I find a good amount of oxidation in it. Anyone good have shape. a comment on it? It's creamy, very creamy beer. Well, good. Okay. It's creamy. Well, that's good. They did that job well. Um, I would say let's pass out our next beer so I can have one. Hold on a second. Let me get my daughter to get me one. <laughs> A vice glass goes like this, and it comes out a little bit at the end. A vice beer says, it's the German bottle, it says Brown Weiss on it. I couldn't find Schneider Weiss. I love Schneider Weiss. It's fantastic. Show it to me, and I'll tell you. Um, 
but I found an A in there. So I went with that. No, that's an IP. It says IPA right on it. No, the other one. Sorry, guys. The one, the bottle. Jennifer, the bottle. it's hard to find good Jennifer, help. Jennifer, do these assistants travel with you? And <laughs> For the first time, I'm taking my assistant to Tampico, Mexico, to a, uh, an, an, it's hey, a bottle Jennifer, of beer. Um, yeah, I got a question fridge. for you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so when you know, I don't know if the people can can people on this the video see me if I'm up here. Okay, well then, hey, then you see what it, the, who's asking what. So when you were talking about adding the chemicals, the mash versus the boil kettle, can you expound a little bit more about that? Like, why would you yeah. do one versus the other? Yeah, hold on a second. She's killing me. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, I was just talking about you talking about the treatment of your foundation water with um, acid to keep your, uh, to, to keep, to buffer your mash so you, so your, uh, so your wort doesn't climb too high in pH. Because the more you sparge with your water, you're going to see a creep. A lot of people say, oh, don't take below three Play Doh, right? Well, that's, that's a nice technique, but that's not really what, what they're really talking about is that you creep up in pH the lower in Play Doh you drop. So when you start taking runs below three Play-Doh, sometimes, you know, you know two, five, you're, you're, it, 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 as your Play-Doh runs go down, your mash goes up for the most part, generally speaking. So if you treat your foundation water when you don't have any like a specialty malts in like your Pilsner brew and things like that, then um, you help buffer the mash by creeping up in pH. Does that make sense? Definitely. What about where you're adding your calcium chloride? If you're putting the calcium chloride into the mash tun versus the boil kettle, what would drive? Yeah, I add the, the I add the calcium chloride throughout um, my bucket of calcium chloride. Well, first of all, I, I put the calcium chloride in the, my, my my little bucket and then I hydrate it. Please remember that um, if you pour hot water on the calcium chloride, it boils. So that's a safety you know, safety first. Um, so just use cold water, whisk it around. And then and it's going to be a very small amount for you guys, you know, but don't use your finger and use cold water. And then I, I, I don't put it into the foundation water. I just slowly add it in, but all of it's in before I'm 50%, before I, you know, before I'm about 50% of the way done with my mash. It's all in there. Thanks. Um, so I got an Ainger Vice beer. Um, I think Vice is just a fantastic, a fantastic, um, session beer. I love Schneider Weiss. When I go up to um, Portland, I go to uh, Prost and drink a lot of Schneider Weiss. It's really fun. Um, I could just drink them all day long. This one's pouring really clear, but I'm not doing the special technique. There's a special technique where you're able to pour a Weiss beer all the way down and lift the bottle up. All I do is end up spilling beer everywhere. I'm a brewer. I'm not very good at the beerista stuff. So, um, of course, you know, Weiss beer has vice yeast uh made with vice yeast there's usually a low rest where um we are developing the four via via guayacol and it's a kind of a mouthful but it helps the it's it's part of the ester profile of the banana and the clove like esters that come from the vice beer as well vice meaning you know wheat crystal vice this is a this supposed to be a this is called a brow vice yeah, but it's a Hefe Weiss, authentic Bavarian Hefe Weiss. So um, one of my favorite, favorite session beers. Um, so while we're enjoying this, you know, like I mentioned, I because I can see it's it's 8, 8, 10. I don't want to talk the whole time for you, but I did want to tell you that I'm spending quite a bit of time um, down in South America um, and in Latin America. So I'll be traveling to Tampico, Mexico for Oro Rojo. I'm, st I'm spending a lot of time with George Strong, um, Pete Slausberg. Uh, Peter Buchart, who used to run, um, and his wife, Rezzy, who used to run um, New Belgium. I was there with um, um, 
Oh, gosh. Uh, from Southampton, who wrote the Farmhouse Ale book. Uh, Phil Markowski, last time. Chris Kuzma out of New York. Um, John Palmer, a lot of um, Palmer spending a lot of time there. So all these kind of old ha- old, old folks uh, that, you know, we've been in the industry a long time. We're gone in South America. Um, and uh, first of all, it's a really great place. We really enjoy it. But we travel around a lot together, um, helping brew pubs, helping home brewers. Um, and just spreading what we've learned up here over, you know, the last 40 years and making beer because craft beer is really just kind of, you know, starting to gain some speed down there. And people are opening brew pubs and, and we want to make sure there's any, if there's any information we can give them that we're down there giving it to them. So we get invited to a lot of cups. Um, I've been to um, Bogota and Medellin a couple times this year. That's in Colombia and uh, hope to get to Cali and Cartagena someday. And then, um, traveled to Ecuador last year, uh, Quito and Cumbaya, and been to Lima, Peru. And these are all for beer cups. And I'm so going to Tampico, I'm taking my daughter and um, she's got activities during the day while I'm tasting beer and helping. And I'm basically, I'll go down and I judge cups and I'll do a presentation and basically, you know, we do activities at night and events and just talking and giving all this knowledge that I'm giving to you today and, and then some with all the brewers around. And so, you know, we have kind of a Russell, a Russell Shear award that um, I won in 2011, I think. Um, and it's, it's for the, it's kind of a lifetime achievement award for brewers, craft brewers, but for me, the meaning of it, and I knew Russell from Widmere. Um, um, sorry. It was not, he did. Was it Widmere or it was a uh, wine coop. I'm sorry. Wine coop in Denver. He died at a very early age. His parents set him up the award it's not just the innovation in craft brewing, but it's the sharing of knowledge. I, I see a lot of unfortunate problems right now in the cannabis in- industry. I live in Grass Valley. It's one of our major economies up here. And these guys and girls do not share knowledge like brewers do. It's very interesting to see them in the beginning and the pioneering of this industry. And I, and it, the comp- competitiveness and the secret- secrecy. And if I could encourage them in any way to just open up a little bit I really believe what is good for one's good for all. It's always worked for us in craft brewing. We still, to this day, have that same tenant. What's good for one's good for all. If your pub's doing well and people have a great experience, they're going to go to another pub when they're traveling, vacationing, opens in the town. So you want them to have good beer. They're not competition. They're going to help you also make, you know, bring people into your pub. So well, that's, what we've, that's, what we've seen, yeah. that's what we've seen in San Diego for sure is the com- camaraderie especially in the early days has been just amazing and wonderful to see the support, how much support everybody gives each other. That's fantastic. And I, I love that about our industry. And I mean, really, I, I'm, I've been, I've been really just so immersed in it. I was literally, I, I've made some assumptions. I couldn't believe when I kept hearing these people would come over to my house and I, I mean, you can't have friends in Grass Valley without having at least 10 farmers that, you know, I mean, a lot of my friends are farmers and I consistently hear the keeping of information and it's just so sad. So as much as I can do is share our experience with them and encourage them to, you know, share with each other and band together and work together, you know, for, you know, um, making better, you know, growing better, you know, weed and and getting their, 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 and educating people. So people are getting what they want, you know, whether it's sleepy or, becoming awake and you know maintaining control and stuff so um that's something that i highly encourage you know so session beers i mean really are are great for culture and then i'm going to kind of open it up um and we can dissect anything you want about session beers together and questions i hope um but i'll end on not end but end me talking all the time so i drink a little beer and take a break um but i'm not going anywhere is on culture session beers are great for culture i mean it's just they're little said tend to be a little bit safer. Um, you can have your customers come and drink a couple session beer, you know, three, four session beers and maybe stay under the, you know, the, 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 and have maybe something to eat, stay under the legal limit of driving with, you know, alcohol and get home fine and maybe be with their family and get to work the next day. They're conducive for, um, our culture in a lot of ways, uh, conducive for, you know, great for cans, um, taking, to the river and i mean if you think that craft beer is about 12 maybe it's 13 i'll put another percentage on but somewhere between 12 and 14 percent of all beer sold in north america is craft beer well that means 
86% is American Premium Lager. Well, American Premium Lager is session beer. <laughs> so people like session beer. They like to be able to, you know, drink quite a few of them. Um, it's pretty shocking to remember because when we're in the craft community and we're home brewers and all we do is talk about craft and go to brew pubs, it's pretty amazing to think that, you know, 86 percent still a, mer- a big macro American premium lager. High quality, you know, they really do make high quality beer. It's just not very unique or diverse. It's very kind of, un- you know, one dimensional. Um, but their parameters are they're very good brewers. They're just not making different styles and you know experimenting with hops and dry hop techniques it's very kind of you know 12 ibu no hop aroma little corn or a little rice depending if you're coors or if you're a you know budweiser it's very kind of simplistic um but people seem to want to buy it in a 30 rack (laughs) Um, so it is kind of interesting to think about that so uh, but i believe session beers is also if anybody out there is thinking about opening up a brew pub in my book, um, I do a comparative analysis, and I take efficiency into um, respect. I take um, – and so what I do is I put an IPA out there, and if you guys are done with your vice, pour the IPA, and, I can, and I'll end up – you can ask me questions about session IPAs because I have specific ideas about brewing them, and we can talk more about hops. We can talk about dry hopping techniques if you want to, um, is that um, – yeah, I do this thing at the end of the book where I say, okay, let's say your flagship beer you decide is one brewery decides it's a session IPA, one brewery decides their flagship is a regular IPA, one brewery decides it's a double IPA. Across the board, it's you know they're all the same barrel edge and it's forty percent. And I show how much more money you can bring in by making your flagship a session IPA because making session beers in a commercial sense makes you a lot more money because people will still pay a pretty good amount of money for a session beer, but it costs a lot less to make because you're using less ingredients because you, you don't need as much Play-Doh in the beginning. So, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to put you ahead. on the spot, Jennifer. Go ahead. You, when suge- did you put me on the spot? You suggested, the, you suggested the Schneider Weiss mm-hmm. and I'm glad you did. It's a wonderful beer. And and I think I think and hopefully people thought that the the samples that we had were okay. Yeah, I found them at uh, found them at Tip Top um, in the refrigerator. So hopefully they were in fairly decent shape. Um, but you know it's five point four percent. Oh, is it? Shit, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was. I don't know what I was doing. I was putting. No, up, you're. You know, you're. Sorry. That, that, I think the, the point. The point. The point is uh, that it is. It does come down to balance. It comes down to the the quality of the beer, and that five percent cutoff or four point two percent cutoff, whatever it is, you can't let that define session when you can drink the Schneider Weiss all day because it goes down so easy. And uh, was, uh, am I am I on the right track? Yeah, no, it is. I, I apologize. I at least have to, like try to have some. No apologies. Stop that. that. I'm surprised that it's five four. My Ainger is five two. So there, you know, it's, I know, you but see. like you know, it's. I hate it when we draw these lines. I think Pivo's five one. It's fantastic. Yeah, session. that was that was my um, point. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah, an imperial you, you know, it's, session. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Please. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. So great. I'm glad you enjoyed. It. I'm glad it showed up well to the table. Your your, your dry hopping technique for session beers. That's uh, definitely okay. Interesting. Okay. Interested in that, Vienna. Stand up. We're, we're we've already poured the all day IPA. Get the all day IPA. That can that green can. <laughs> and then please get me a pint glass in my glass. Thanks. So your assistant is named Vienna. Right? Yes, my assistant is named Vienna. It's the one with the, the anti-pinky ring. No, no, the one with the metal ring on the top. Yeah, Vienna, um, the first, yes, it is on the right-hand side. There's the, oh, whatever, just give me a pint glass with the red writing. Yeah, to the right. No, it's a big glass like this. 
Okay, I'll get it in a minute. Um, the, um, I won, my first medal I won at um, Great American Beer Festival was uh, for my Vienna Lager. So um, some of the beers I've known for winning awards with is Vienna Lager, the Schwartz beer, um, Alt beer, um, and and I made, and these came from Squatters Pub Brewery. And so I won a gold medal for my first award. It was, it was a very lifetime special moment for me to you know it's it's great you make great beers it took seven years to win an award um and i wasn't like i needed the accolades i just it's nice to to know that you're not the only one that thinks your beer is good you're maybe on the right track so then v vienna was my 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 daughter she and um i thought that was a good name for her so she's named after the beer great name. yeah yeah thank you I'm gonna, grab, I'm gonna grab my pint glass real quick don't go anywhere is right i don't have any pint glasses clean so the next best thing is a duval glass so <laughs> one of my favorite glasses to drink beer out of so okay to answer your question or to talk to you about um dry hopping and just hopping techniques on a session ipa um in the book i go through a mock recipe in a chapter and i use um easy jack um, which I can't find at my, so I originally just wanted to taste Easy Jack with you guys, but it's very hard to find here. Um, so she got all day, which is usually turns out to be a nice session IPA Th that's mass produced. Um, so it's about a 45 IBU. I like a classic. I like to put, um, to dive a little bit deeper into quality of bitterness. I like to put 50% of my IBUs actually probably 65% of all my IBUs go in the uh, first 50% of boil. So I do four hoppings on my uh, session IPA. So it's a plus 75, at plus 75 minutes. Okay. That's going to usually be like a clean German Magnum. Um, and, or you can use anything, but something in a nice, I usually like German Magnum. And then um, I, I boil for about, was that 45 minutes and then for my 30 minute hop gives you enough time to get your mash out and get that over for the you know the farmer to pick up and um then for my 30 then i do another uh i do a 30 minute hop bittering hop i usually use magnum for that as well or something um non you know i could use a chinook or something but i'm not i don't think you get a lot of flavor out of that hop um it's debatable i know but I don't seem to get a ton of flavor when I hop at 30 minutes to the end of boil. Um, maybe a little flavor, but not a ton usually. Um, and both of those hops, uh, the utilization rate for my boil was I don't know, 30%, 0 0.30. Um, so I calculate my BUs. And if I was making 45, a 45 IBU beer, then I am putting in, let's say here, so 45 BUs um times let's say 0.65 you know 30 bus are going in 30 you know 25 to 30 bus are going in 30 minutes before the end of boil now on my third hop i do like a plus 10 or a plus 15 to eob that really drives a lot of flavor and i will start that's when i start getting creative I'll start to blend maybe, uh, you know, what is, am I using Simcoe? Am I using a Citra? What am I going for? Dank? Am I going for fruity floral? Am I putting in an El Dorado? Am I doing the man, you know, um, you know, what am I trying for? Centennial or Chinook or, you know, what, you know, is there a new, new hop variety out there that I want to try? Um, and so that's where I'm trying to drive my hop flavor. Um, probably, you know, I'm going for like, you know, what do I have to work with now about 15 BU, you know, 15 to 20, you know, maybe I'll put like 10 BU in there, maybe, you know, 10 BU in the whirlpool or end of boil hop, right? Now that 10 minute to EOB for my boil, okay, all boils are different, um, um, is um, I utilization rate is about 20%. 
I calculate. Okay, so that's in the calculation of BUs. Now for the end of boil hop or five minutes to EOB or whirlpool hop, your wort is sitting at 175 Fahrenheit for quite some time. Okay, we usually do a little rest. We like to do a five, maybe a five minute stand. We like to do a maybe a 10 minute whirlpool. You know, it's in there, a good 15 plus minutes before it's getting cold. Okay, so you're getting 15% utilization out of a five EOB, a EOB, or whirlpool hop. A lot of people on the old Beersmith program, they weren't calculating any B, any util, any BUs for these hops. Well, they're wrong. And I think you guys have maybe been, I think there's been some recent articles about people saying, hey, don't forget, you're getting BUs here. So I'll keep my BUs down. And now, well, wait a minute, where's my aroma? Where's my aroma? Well, you better get good at dry hopping. You know, if you take, start pushing all your hops at the end of the boil and try to get your aroma out of them, you start raising the BUs that you're extracting from those hops. And I get kind of a tongue grabber, kind of an astringent feeling in my mouth. So I like, I like to go to old school hopping techniques where most of your bitterness is driven up front. And then I do do bitterness throughout the boil. But like I said, it's mostly up front. And then there's some at the end. Flavor is driven about 15, 10 to 15 minutes towards the EOB. But if I'm going for that aroma, dry hopping. So I like to dry hop twice. Um, I start, um, I do my fermentation, my, all my IPAs or doubles are at minimum. They're about 21 days. I don't do anything less than 21 day turn on an IPA. And that's, this is all taught to me by Russian river and Vinny. So, you know, uh, fermentation complete 24 hour diacetyl rest. And then I go, we go ahead and cool it just a little bit, maybe five degrees Fahrenheit. Most of our fermentations, we're using uh, 1056, which is California ale yeast. Um, we cool it down maybe five degrees, maybe get it down to 60. After a diacetyl rest is done, drop a lot of that yeast out, get a lot of flocula flocculation, yeast, yeast cells and proteins coming together. They drop out, go ahead, do your dry hop. Um, you know, we're crazy. We're about, you know, three pounds a barrel. And um, we would do about three pounds a barrel. Um, and so about 70% of that hop, that dry hop charge. So let's say you have 10 barrels, you know, so that's three pounds a barrel. That's 30 pounds times 0 0.75, 75% of that, that goes your first dry hop. Then we would not lower the temperature. I'd never lower it below 60, you know, usually about 62. And then we uh, wait three days and then we put the rest of the dry hops in. And then we wait a couple more days, same temperature, all the same kind of warm, dry hopping temperature. And then we go ahead and cool down, give that a day. And then we go ahead and transfer and use BioFine if you want to get gain real good clarity. It turned out really good. That's really a classic way of dry hopping. I went to Auburn Ale House and um, completely redid his um, IPA. Um, the brewmaster's IPA, he's kind of a brewmaster owner. So he's really kind of on the owner side and he's kind of hadn't really been paying, wasn't really diving into new hopping techniques and stuff like that at the time. He's running a business. I totally understand. Um, so I, I took the victory malt out for one and, and, uh, and, and said, I really don't think this is serving our IPA well. And he was using an old beer Smith program and he has hops. He had way too many BUs. I calculated it out. He was calculated out to 145 IBUs on his IPA. And I'm like, this is, you know, it's 6%, but this is not, this is not pleasurable. I don't want to have another IPA here. Uh, the quality was there, but his bitterness was all over the place. He had no calculations on the end. He was using extract in the end. Hold on a second. And um, so um, I reorganized where his hops were. And then I reorganized how we did our dry hopping. I, um, we bought a, we bought a, um, a Gahalt, uh, we bought an Orbisphere, so we started measuring um, total packaged oxygen. Um, I bought a Hawk HQ30. We started measuring dissolved oxygen on the way into the fermenter. And uh, that's very important to make sure you have a proper amount of dissolved oxygen in your work going into the fermenter and not over oxygenating reduces your chance of developing acetaldehyde. So um, we did all of these wonderful things to, um, to the beer. Uh, Gold Digger was the name of it, and I won my first IPA award at JBF um, the year it was the largest category, which is 411. It might have been, it might be larger now that we have more entries, but it was 
huge. It was right. It was like the year before Hazy's just went crazy. So I think other people thought it was a pretty good IPA as well. And this was a session. This was the regular IPA. However, I do the exact same technique for my session. I just don't have as much BUs. And I slightly dry, I slightly drop the dry hop rate. You know, I don't go maybe as high as three, you know. Yeah, I, in the lower, you know, gravity, delicate, you know, session beers, uh, I'm concerned about uh, dry hopping and getting that grassiness. Well, one way you can get grassiness, and I know for a fact how to get grassiness out of an IPA dry hop, is because they built the grassiness into their flavor profile, which was Longhammer. You want to taste a grassy IPA, um, and I'm trying to be rude. Some people like that. It's all it's all to their own druthers. But they were dry hopping Longhammer and making Longhammer before we really knew a lot about hop aroma, dry hopping, and we were doing lots of different techniques back then. And they dry hopped it cold. And it's a real surefire way of getting grassy flavor out of your hops. So keeping that temperature, you know, warm dry hopping is and when i say warm i mean you know you know, 60 and above you know so they also dry hopped prior to fermentation so they put the hops in the fermenter which i'm not a big fan of um, it drives grassiness as well and you're scrubbing out the aroma you're trying to get it doesn't and you're really not getting your most bang for your dollar so well, yeah, I just experienced that. You know, I'm getting a lot of uh, inputs and suggestions from people to, you know, throw hops uh, in in the fermenter, you know, bio transformation, blah 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 blah. And I, I just came out with a grassy, you know. Yeah, no, I, I listen up. We're brewers. We love new ideas, and it's fun to play with. And it's fun to think that you know. And and a lot of times there's some interesting things going on. Um, one firm believer that doesn't that that's not a sign a sign a card carrying member of biotransformation is um jean marie rock and he brew he was a brewmaster at orval for 30 years and i've sat he's a friend of mine i sat long hours talking to him about that and he's a very very smart man he's not he's not that that much of a believer in biotransformation now i'm sure it happens i mean you know um the glycosides and, um, you know, the, the sugars left over from the hops, you know, and the, the yeast interacting with them. I don't, I've never, in, I've never seen a great result with that. Um, I think what's really interesting about hops, some of the interesting thing is like, you know how the hops from Yakima are so different from the Willamette Valley. You get more of the earthiness out of Willamette Valley and um, the spiciness. And then you get a lot of that fruitiness and the Simcoe's and stuff out of, Yakima is the terrar, okay, but not the soil necessarily. I should actually, I'm going to take that back, but how, how they're irrigated. So in Willamette Valley, like in Bavaria, it is um, from rainfall, okay, but in the Yakima Valley where it's really dry, it's drip irrigation. And I talked to a lot of weed farmers about this as well, as far as the aromas that they're getting in their product. Um, and the drip, uh, when you have natural rainfall that's hydrating your hops you uh you get a lot more powdery mildew and therefore you have to treat with a lot more fungicides which which bring copper and when you have copper in your fungicides which you don't really make fungicides without them i don't think um that affects the flavor of the hop and so you'll find a lot of a lot of uh, farmers that don't use drip irrigation for their hops are not getting these fruit forward hops because of the fungicide nature in the copper and i found that was fascinating to learn about that i work a little bit with hop growers of america and we give seminars around the country around the world i've been to shanghai for them in berlin and spoke at vlb and i've worked with matt brindelson and john john mallet um for these talks and that's kind of where i picked up that information and a lot of the research that they found out and i thought that was very very interesting and it was funded, you know, hops are a major, um, major crop in the United States. We're one of the leading, I think we are the leading producers. We just overcame Germany like a couple of years ago. We grow more hops than any other country. And that's Germany included. Um, so uh, as an, you know, as an export item, we're funded through the USDA, through the MAPS program. So it's kind of cool to be sent by the government to talk about hops. <laughs> Um, it's 832. I know you guys have a hard no at nine o'clock from your space. Um, 
And so if there's any other questions I want, you guys probably want to talk to each other about like, you know, you probably got some coolers in your car. You want to share some beers. You might want to talk yeah. about the golf game or the next festival no. you're going to. So I don't want to take up your whole time. Okay. While um, we're, is there any other questions? While, or? We're close, while we're closing out on questions, I'm going to, we're going to pour some Guinness because. Mm-hmm. Okay. I will say on the Guinness, sorry to interrupt. There's about roughly 10 million pints of Guinness served and drank every day around the world. I always love that statistic. So we're gonna we're Garrett. gonna join yeah. them. We're gonna we're yes, join them because we don't want to go under par with that. It is the most popular um, worldwide distributed dark session beer there is. Um, obviously, we all know there's about eight to ten percent roasted barley in there. Um, there is no um, no chocolate malt. Um, the BUs are aggressive, more so than obviously like in a premium lager. They're up in the 30s, even the low 40s. A little bit of caramel malt, but the roasted barley does most of the talking. Um, no need for acidification on that foundation water because those roasted the roasted barley brings a, a lot of acidification in and of itself. So make sure you have well, a nice pop. Go ahead. Jennifer. What? The hops used in, in that. Well, I would say they're, you know, German and they're not, they do, a, they probably, they do two they, and from my understanding or one right in the beginning, maybe in the middle, but there's this, you should not have hop flavor. You should have not hop, you should not have hop aroma. Yeah. You're just literally backing up the backbone of that malt with some hop bitterness. Jennifer, this not a hop, you know. Jennifer, this is Andy Gamlin here. I have a question maybe for you. Maybe he had a Guinness, a Guinness draft should be four too. What does the can say? Jennifer, Andy Gamble yeah. here. Yes, I have a question for you. I'm a, uh, I'm an avid mountain biker, and uh, going out, I went out to Utah uh, out to Moab, uh, and I was inspired by one of your beers, um, the uh, um, Full Suspension. And yeah. uh, one of the things that sort of inspired me was uh, going out to Utah. Well, of course, all the beers were what you said, four percent at that time, and going up. Uh, doing some mountain biking and then coming down off the mountain when it was kind of hot and then hitting this kind of lineup of all these 4% beers, it was quite refreshing. And one of them that really uh, stood out for me was was that one right there, um, the uh, uh, full suspension. And I really enjoyed the, the malt bill on that. Um, before your book came out, I saw that there was a recipe published on it and I took that beer and uh, was able to, I, I, I used the basically the malt bill that you had, and I used some uh, basically West Coast hopping on it, and made a real nice session nice. beer that I called Slick Rock after one of the big trails awesome. up there. But the question really I had for you was, what really was the inspiration behind that beer? What it, what was, what did you? Can you tell me a story about you know yeah. how you developed that beer? I can um, because I've I've like a I don't I don't have cats. I have a hundred pound German Shepherd named Mister Bojangles, but. Um, I've got like nine lives. I've lived a lot of different lives in my life um, so far. And so after I was deadhead and I was, I was uh, running my brew pub, um, I took a little bit of a break before I went back to college. I ended up going to college and getting my undergraduate in sociology, my master's in social work. I went to a bunch of brewing schools. I stayed brewing the whole time, put myself through school. Long story short, I became a mountain bike racer in Utah um, in the early 90s. So at the time, it was called NORBA, National Off-Road Racing Association. And so I raced in Vail. I raced in Moab. I raced in Deer Valley, Big Bear, Mammoth. Um, and I got my first and uh, my fir- I got my first full suspension mountain bike. I used to ride for a company called Titus Titanium, which is now called Pivot. And I got my first full suspension mountain bike frame and I had to have I was at the brewery so much I have I had him ship it to the brewery because that was safer than shipping it to the house I lived in with all the other college with college kids and you know who knows we're going to steal it so I knew it would be safe if they shipped it to my brewery now at the time I was a cross-country racer so I rode a titanium full suspension bike you know Uh, my first full suspension bike was a classic rock hopper by by um you know oh, oh god What's the name of that? It starts with an S, you know, I forgot. It's not Schwinn, but it's the uh, Specialized. Yeah, so I wrote a rock hopper. Um, but my first full uh, my first full suspension was, yeah, my, my rock hopper didn't have rear suspension. So I had a rock shock on my uh, my first full suspension. And I, I, grab, I matured up to aluminum frame called the Racer X. Um, so I raced for about five years. But then when I 
really got into my master's program and things heated up around the brewery. I started doing more competitions and more responsibilities and production. I couldn't, you know, training and all of that and traveling and then the beer festivals and college, it, you know, something kind of had to give. So I, I just rode re- recreational for that. So I, sp- I've spent a lot of time down there in Moab, I've ridden the slick rock, um, Gemini bridges, um, poison spider, um, just an absolutely magical spot down there. So that's a cool story. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Very cool. Any, any other questions? Um, I, I just want to let you know, I brewed a beer from your book recently. Uh, it was the uh, Belgian Wit. It was the Allagash White. Oh, I love that beer. Yeah. And I, I, I took it to a recent festival in Southern California just uh, last week. And uh, it was uh, well received, and I love it. So thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, the key with that beer, as you probably found out, is you got to have a light hand if you're gonna use, you know, the coriander, the port, you know, the, the orange peel, and then the little, you know, tip, the grains of paradise, which is the African pepper. You've got to be very light handed if you're gonna make a coffee session beer. If you're gonna make a vanilla bean session beer, you just got to be very light handed, you know, because you like you, you know, just like you are with your bitterness, like you are with your caramel malt, you know, um, it's just important that you realize that you don't have that that major flavor constituent of alcohol to hide behind. So you really got to just really, it's a very delicate process, um, but you can make wonderful beers and people will be astounded that they're 4%. Yeah. It's uh, it's one of my favorite beers right now. Um, oh, cool. Secret ingredient uh, spice was cardamom. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, one, yeah. one quarter teaspoon of cardamom, a five gallon batch. And, it just kind of added a layer of complexity. Right? Oh, I'll try it the next time I make a, a wit. That sounds great. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for sharing. Jennifer, uh, this yes. is this is Bob. I just today cold crashed uh, Carl Heron's English Amber Ale after maturation. So I'm looking forward to uh, trying that as well from your oh, book. Oh wow, that was a special recipe. Yes, it was. I, yeah, that's I'm looking a very forward, special recipe. Looking forward to it. Yeah, that's going to be fantastic. Oh, I'm glad you guys are trying out these recipes. Uh, the brewers were really wonderful at sharing them with me. And I, I couldn't believe the collection of recipes I was able to get from from my friends and from the brewers around the country. It was it was really wonderful. Um, not No one said, no, I don't want to be, you know, everyone. And they just 100% divulged everything, you know. So I'm glad you guys are having fun with it. And um I was really happy to be included in your tasting and really happy included to be in your group. I want to say thank you. Well, no, we want to say thank you to you, Jennifer. Oh my goodness. Awesome. What a great, what a great evening. Awesome. Cheers. cheers. All right. Cheers, you guys. Cheers, Enjoy cheers to stuff. Jennifer. Yep. Thank you very much.